Carrying on from the six basic shot cinematography revision video, I just wanted to go back over uh, the language of camera movement. So these are the what the terms mean for how we move the camera during particular scenes. So the first thing is a static shot. A static shot, we're not moving the camera. We've usually got the camera on a tripod, it's pointing at a subject, we're filming it. A moving platform that the camera is mounted on, a moving a trolley, is known as a dolly. So if you are filming professionally um, in a large budget production, you'd probably la actually lay down little railway tracks so you can sl put a platform on with the camera and the cameraman and slide it um, without any jerks or bumps. Um, in lower budgets, you might just use anything on wheels, a skateboard, an office chair, uh, the poor man's dolly, uh, I suppose, is to put your video camera on something like a jumper on a table and just drag it across. So, when you're moving the camera towards a subject, you dolly in. When you're moving away from a subject, you dolly out. The moving platform is what's known as the dolly. I said you might use uh, in a big production uh, a dolly on tracks, which obviously takes quite a while to, to set up that sort of shot. Nowadays, with in-camera image stabilization, a lot of those little bumps, well, you have been electronically sort of filled it out so you don't see them so it's a bit less important to do that and also those jumps and bumps may be the very thing that you want you may be going for that handheld camera look so cheap fly on the wall documentary if that's the feel you're going for then hand holding the camera gives the whole thing a sense of realism the camera is part of the action. It's moving with the action. You, the audience, are in there. Now, sometimes this is overdone This uh, in low-budget movies, and it can just make the film look very amateurish. Um, but handheld camera work is... is um, gives give something a sense of realism if done properly because it's associated with that um, documentary storytelling that doc yeah, telling the truth so it gives everything a sense of truth and realism if done well if we've got our camera mounted on a tripod we can actually move the camera by tilting it up or down for moving it from side to side. So a horizontal movement is called a pan, an up and down movement is called a tilt. If you wanted to pan and tilt a lot, you'd probably have to mount the camera on a crane. And a crane isn't like a crane in construction building skyscrapers type crane. Um, normally a crane is a relatively small thing where you've got uh, somebody holding the camera on a seat it's like it's on one end of a seesaw and on the other end of the seesaw you've got a counterweight and then it's quite easy for the cameraman's assistant to pull down on the counterweight and make the camera and, and cameraman go up in the air if you've got a universal joint in the middle of the seesaw you can also make them go from side to side so and the crane shot, uh, again, relatively um, um, complicated to set up and to get to look right. Um, tends to be used more with higher budget films. But because of that, the in-camera image stabilization, the same effect can be done on a lot cheaper budget these days. 
one of the reasons that it can be done better is because of what's known as Steadicam. A Steadicam is a device which allows somebody holding a camera to not have those those little jerky movements, but have a more fluid, smoother movement because it's the camera, it's the way it's attached to the camera with a, uh, a counterweight to balance it, to allow the movement uh, to flow a lot better. So there are basic types of movement of camera. We can also, with our lenses, get the impression of camera movement. So we can zoom in and zoom out by changing, changing the focal length uh, of the camera. Um, so we can make a tracking shot, a tracking shot where we follow the subject or by using a steady cam, by walking in and out, by using a dolly to dolly in or dolly out. We can get a non steady cam sort of handheld feel, but we can to some degree get the same sort of tracking shot by just changing the zoom. Now, when you're changing the zoom, you've got to be careful and you've got to consider something else. You've got to consider depth of field. We had a little discussion about camera apertures a while ago, where depth of field is a term which is relates to the amount of a shot that's within focus. A narrow depth of field means only part of the image is in focus. The background, foreground is out of focus. Whereas uh, a deep focus means everything's in focus. So for example, if you're looking at uh, classically Orson Welles' film is famous for its deep focus, for having everything uh, filmed is in focus, everything in film is correctly lit, so you can see everything that's in every shot. Um, changing the focus at, during a scene is a great storytelling t technique. It allows you to look from one person to somebody standing behind them and their reaction to what they're saying back to the subject. And uh, if you want to see this done really well, I think Mike Nichols in his film The Graduate uh, has some absolute brilliant pieces of storytelling done by just changing the, um, the, the subject that's in focus by changing the focal length and having everything in a fairly narrow depth of field. So narrow depth of field, uh, alley here, at the cafe, we want to see Ali. We're interested in Ali. Ali's enjoying the cake. We don't really care about the other people at the cafe in the background. We don't care about the garden that, she, that, that she's sitting outside. We're interested in Ali. That's our subject. We can have a narrow depth of field. A deep focus, everything's in focus. Far more useful when we're filming action, far more, useful when we've got a lot of motion going on. So here, Puffing Billy steaming through the forest. We need to see Puffing Billy. We need to see the smoke. We need to see the trees. We need to have all the motion. We need everything in focus. So we're going to film that. Deep focus with a very small camera aperture. Let's say a large F number on our uh, camera, whereas narrow depth of field is a relatively large aperture, uh, which is a small, um, a small F number. So um, I also just wanted to, while we're talking about that, just mention uh, when we're choosing this angle, who is watching it. Um, and when we're considering what of of these different types of camera movements we're filming, it can be very, uh, you know, I mean, we can do some very clever things, particularly now that we've got these uh, uh, video cameras, which have got in, 
image stabilization, in camera stabilization, or in lens stabilization systems, and steady cams on a low budget, we can get quite a good feel to do some of these shots. But please don't overdo them because most of the time you're telling a story and you're telling a story from somebody's point of view. So perhaps it's a lot simpler just to set up a camera and say, this is the person who's watching it. This is where they're standing. This is what they see of this conversation. This is their point of view. We can have that zoom in from the rooftop, but who's on the rooftop seeing it? It might not make any storytelling sense. Technically, it's becoming a lot easier to do some of these camera movements and pull them off and make them look professional, but that doesn't mean to say that it makes any storytelling sense to do so. So if ever you see any of these camera movements uh, in a film, think just think to yourself, why isn't this just filmed from somebody's point of view? What is the storytelling element that the director feels setting up this shot was necessary for? Because most of the shots do require a bit more setup time. They're a little bit more complicated. Just think of the point of view and what they're trying to do with each shot. Okay, thank you.